Okay, so um, we got uh, one of our own um, that I, re I remember, and I mentioned this before, I think, but I remember, I don't know how many years ago, five, six years ago, uh, after Austin graduated, uh, what was that school up in San Francisco, Maritime? Yes. So he, he had his job, and then he started feeling the, uh, the, uh, the nudging. I call it the nudging. The God's calling, and God's drawing him, and God's pulling him into uh, ministry. And uh, so I said, well, then you have to train. So he said, well, I just finished college. I said, we got to go back. And so, uh, so we uh, prayed about it, and he went to um, the uh, Feinberg Institute Talbot, Great, great, one of the better schools in the country, Bible schools. He went up to Talbot for a number of years, and he focused on the Jewish program at Talbot that chosen people have started called the Feinberg Center. And so Austin graduated a couple years ago, and he's working with us, with our youth and our people. And so every so often, we ask Austin if he'd come forward and share the word with us. So let's give wel a welcome to Austin. Thanks to the rest of the elder board, too, for giving me uh, a chance to come up here and share. Shabbat Shalom to all of you this morning. Hope, um, hope you all are doing well and are uh, looking forward to what I have to share this morning because a lot of it isn't going to be positive, but it's needed, especially in our time and what we're going through right now. Um, and as I was prepping for this message and preparing to kind of put together what I wanted to preach this morning, Larry kind of challenged me and gave me some, uh, some points he wanted me to hit on, and um, I think I came up with something pretty good, so I'm interested to see what you guys think. Um, have you guys ever been on a long car trip or a long road trip before? I'm sure everyone has. The, the, the car trip or the road trip is so long, and you know it's going to be so torturous, and it's, it, you're going to be taking multiple naps, eating multiple snacks, probably multiple bathroom breaks, right? You know you're probably going to get car sick along the way because there's going to be a couple bumps in the road. Uh, me personally, I get car sick literally every time I sit, and I sit in the car. I, the car doesn't even have to be moving. I just look at the book, look down at a book or my phone, and next thing you know, Mom, I need a, I need a bag. I need a bag. That's, that's just me. But I always remember when I was a kid going on these long road trips, right? These long, long car rides and looking at the signs and the miles amount of miles to the destination, right? Five, six hundred miles. You go along the car trip, it's in the 400 miles, 300 miles, 200 miles. The, the, I love it, this, the state of Cal wherever you're driving, and usually it was California for me, they even loved to torture me and put 25 miles to the destination because that's how close you were and how close I was. And I'd always find myself asking my parents the question, are we there yet? Are we there yet? A couple hours go by. Are we there yet? No, no, no. And finally, yes, we're there. Oh, thank God, we're there. Yes. But that's the question I, was always, I would always ask throughout the entire process in these long road trips. And I think that's pretty telling for where we're at sometimes in our lives when we go through problems. We're always asking ourselves, are we there yet? And usually it's directed towards God, right? Because we're always taught throughout our whole um, spiritual growth and our relationship with God, that we're supposed to wait on Him. But waiting on Him means that He's in control of the destination. But we're always, we find ourselves as human beings, always asking this question in our prayers, when am I going to be done with my problems? Am I there yet? Am I at the destination? When are you going to carry me through? When are you going to get me through the struggles in my life? When tough things come, it could be family problems, could be financial problems, could be political problems, some problems that aren't even under your control, but you seem to be always asking that question, Are, am I there yet? And you're asking God usually. And when you're asking these questions over and over, it can create impatience in you, right? You're always waiting and waiting and waiting. And sometimes you have to wait a long time for your problems to be over with. But see, the problem with 
impatience and developing that form of thought when you're walking through problems is you have to understand that it's basically you're losing sight on how to truly walk through the problem. Because eventually you'll get through problems in life. You'll get through them. But are you truly walking through them and benefiting from the process of coming out on the other side? Are you learning along the way? Are you truly walking? And as believers who have a personal relationship with the Creator, that is so important. Because there are going to be good times in your life. There probably already has been. Numerous blessings you've probably experienced. But there's probably also problems and trials and struggles that you may be experiencing now. And you, in the past, you probably walked through them. But on, when you come on the other side and the problem's over and the struggle's over and you're in kind of the green pasture... Have you truly learned from that experience? And so that's what I want to get at today. How to truly walk through your problems as a believer with a relationship with the Creator. So if you pull out your outlines, and we're going to go through this here, I think it's really important that we internalize this because, like I said, when we're walking through the problems, it could seem like it's taking forever. So we're going to have opportunities to apply this. We're going to have opportunities how to properly walk through our struggles so that we can even help others along the way from our own personal experience. So to set this up here, what is the truth? What is the reality? There's going to be problems, problems, and even more problems. Why? Because this world's imperfect. This world is flawed. So are we. Why? Because we have a sin nature. We're not perfect. We're not going to do everything right. We're going to make mistakes. We're going to have to go through tough times in our lives. And there's going to be multiple problems in different forms along the way. But no matter where we go or what we do, we have to face the problems. We have to face them. We can't hide from them. Because it's just going to make the car trip longer. It's just going to make the lessons tougher. It's just going to make our learning process longer. So as we face the problems, we've, and me personally, I've seen this in my own life, is as soon as I struggle, I'm always looking to the end. When I was a kid, getting in the car, I'm already thinking about the destination. But why is that? It's because humans, we don't like to struggle. We don't like negativity in our lives. It's natural for us to drift towards the comfortable and distance ourselves from the uncomfortable. The biggest thing is because we want control. We want control of our lives. And in our age of, of in our modern age today, we're giving a lot, given a lot of freedom, especially in this country, to do what we want, say what we want, although sometimes it's been limited, especially now. But America stands for freedom. And that freedom sometimes for us can be debilitating, especially as believers, because we want control. But at the same time, we're grappling with, no, 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 God's in control of where we're at. But see, that imperfectness, that flaw that's in us, right? Even as we're sitting here this morning, we want control of our lives. We want to know where we're going. Amen? We want to know what's going to happen in 20, 30 years. It'd be nice so that we can tailor our approach to what we're doing now, but that's not how it is. That's not how God created this universe. So we have a need for urgency. Along with the problems that we're going to face, we have a need for urgency. Like I said, we want that control. Also, in, 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 in addition to not struggling and trying to distance ourselves from the uncomfortableness, we don't want to feel isolated, right? That's a lot of the times when we're going through problems, we do feel isolated. We feel alone. We feel like it's just us versus the world, or us versus this huge obstacle that's in my way. But as believers, we have to remind ourselves we're not alone. We have someone, a creator, who is behind us 100% of the way. 
And every single day we have to remind that because the enemy is always working against you and always trying to pit things against you to think that you can't overcome them or you aren't able to come on the other side a better person. Struggling is the only thing you're going to do in your life. And I'm here to remind you, especially if you're going through a problem or a situation, now you're struggling now, that's not the case. God is 100% for you. Whether you sense it or not, he's right behind you every step of the way. And he's guiding you. So along with the problems, we have a need for urgency. Psalm 23, 4 says, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Whether we're walking on the mountaintops, or we're walking through the valleys, the valley of the shadow of death, we still have to walk. We can't stop. One of the more influential people in my life, in my athletic career, one of the really bright coaches um, in the basketball world, always said to us, and I think it's even true just for people in everyday life as well, you're either getting better or you're getting worse. There's no in-between. There's no in-between. You're either getting better or you're getting worse. We still have to walk. We still have to walk through those valleys that we don't like to walk through. And we can see them coming. I don't want to walk through that. I don't want to walk through that. But you still have to walk. You can't give up on life. Because God has called you to something better on the other side. So when he brings you to that mountaintop, you'll see that you came out of that valley and you'll be encouraged to keep walking. So we still have to walk. And that's why I love Psalm 23, 4. Because everyone focuses on Yes, you're going, to fa- you're going to walk through that valley. Yes, the valley's dark. Yes, it's, it's tempting to get self-centered and go through that. Ta- uh, that, that thought process of, I'm never going to get out of this valley. It's so dark and terrible. You still have to walk. Because there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So remember that. And the biggest self-reflection I want you to ask yourself this morning is, is your heart and is your mind aligned while you're facing problems. I'll say that one more time. Is your heart and is your mind aligned when you're struggling? Because if our heart is truly seeking God's presence and waiting on the Lord, we're going to make clear and thoughtful decisions. But what does our mind do? What does that flawed and perfect mind tend to do? It tends to drift, right? It tends to go to places where it shouldn't be. And sometimes it takes over your heart and makes you make decisions that you regret and you wish you didn't make. So that's why it's so important to have your heart and your mind aligned when you're facing problems. So take out your Bibles or if your notepads or your uh, iPads or wherever your Bible apps and let's turn to Psalm 13, chapter 13. And this is one of David's Psalms he wrote Definitely while he was struggling. Definitely while he was going through problems and things that, you know, would scare most people to death. If this was put in a newspaper column, I think this psalm, if this was put in a newspaper column, I think it could be called the daily struggles. And so that's why I put it in your outlines. Because that summarizes what this psalm is covering. The daily struggles that David was going through at that time in his life. And his conversation was with God as he was going through these things. And I think we can use Psalm 13 to really tailor our approach to how we encounter problems, whatever they may be, as we keep walking. It's really a prayer for help because problems, fear, and strife were a huge part of David's life. You know, from Goliath, we all know from to Saul, to even his own family member, to his son Absalom, who kicked him out of Jerusalem and took over the kingdom. He encountered a lot of problems and struggles throughout his life. So when we go through Psalm 13, keep that in mind. This is a writer who has been through it. And he was probably still going through it. That's why he was writing these things down, to probably go over and over as he was calling out to God. 
So in Psalm 13, 1, we see an assumption of God's view. Psalm 13, 1 says, How long, O Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? He's probably going through a time where it doesn't seem like it's going to end anytime soon. He's feeling alone. He's feeling isolated. He's feeling like God's forgot him and has hid his face, face from him. No offense to David, but it, kind, it sounds kind of self-centered, doesn't it? Sounds like it's all David saying, you've forgotten me. Will you hide your face from me? Feels like he's, he's getting a little depressed. And he's letting it control him. And it's a question to ask ourselves, and I'm sure we can answer it in 0.5 seconds, but have any of us ever been depressed? I have. There have been times in my life where it seems like I was never getting out of it. It seems like there were times in my life where I was never going to see the end of my struggle. And I got depressed. And it seemed like David was getting depressed here too. Because it seemed like his problems were never going to end. I had a friend a while back. He's involved in ministry now. um, And he really loved the land of Israel. He loved the Jewish people. But he had never been to Israel itself. He had never been to the land. It had been a dream of his to go to the land. But it was at a certain time in his life where everything was stripped from him. Financially, his friends. He felt distance from his family. He was facing intense emotional attacks from the enemy. He felt distance from God himself. And it was funny because at this time in his life, there was someone who came to him and said, hey, do you want to go to the land of Israel with me? I'll pay for everything. You can just join me just to experience the land. And I remember him telling me this story. He says, of all times, God, you want me to go now when I feel at my lowest? And this person, just as a little backdrop on this individual, this person is very, very energetic. He's very, very, he gets excited over literally anything. If you get him into something and you get him, get him fired up, he's ready to go. He is probably the most excited person you'll ever meet in your life. So think about this person who's depressed and who's down in the dumps being asked to go on the trip of his dreams and he doesn't have to pay a dime. What a blessing. But see, God was working. So as, I'll continue with the story here. So goes to Israel, right? Goes to the Sea of Galilee, gets on the boat. I don't know if any of you have been to Israel, but going into the Galilee and going on that boat and sitting in the middle of the Sea of Galilee, it's an experience. It's so peaceful. And breaking out certain scripture where Yeshua is preaching around the Sea of Galilee and the stories that happened around it just make it come to life. And it's so cool to see it. This person falls asleep on the boat and sits on the boat while the message is being preached. He sits there, falls asleep, because he's so depressed. Get off the boat. They go to Capernaum, right? Where all of these cool instances happen in Yeshua's ministry. They're going through the tour, and where's, our, where's, my, good old, where's my friend? He's sleeping on a bench. He was depressed. His his struggles and his problems were so overwhelming to him that he couldn't even properly live out a dream, even in that moment. And it's funny. God walked him through that problem. God got him through that struggle. Later in life, he looks back on it and says, why did I ever do that? Why didn't I not just recognize God's blessing? Because he's been back to Israel about 10 or 20 times. And he's even led tours back to Israel. But see, he had to walk through certain things and God had to show him that I'm still there. You don't have to be depressed. You can still live out your dreams even through your problems. I think what David's doing here is he's assuming God's view on his life. He's assuming that God's forgotten him. He's assuming that God has hid his face from him. I love the character of Job in the Bible. A person who, gone through, who went through so many things. His family stripped away. 
his wealth stripped away, even his friends coming to stab him in the back and tell him he should just give up on life. But what did Job say? Whether I live or whether I die, blessed be the name of the Lord. That's what we should do when we're walking through life. Not assuming that God's forgotten us, not assuming that he's given up on us, but that he still wants to bless us. And he's still walking with us every step of the way. Thinking that God's forgotten you and his face from you is kind of foolish because he's everywhere at all times. And he knows what your thoughts are, where your thoughts are going to be, and what your thoughts have been. He knows you. Probably better than yourself, he knows you. And it's funny because we're so emotional at times. We're such emotional beings. We have a wide variety and a wide range of emotions that can take us on many different adventures and, and things that we can learn about ourselves, but we're emotional. And in verse, th- in verse 2 of chapter 13, we see this battle of emotions going on. David says, How long am I to feel anxious in my soul with grief in my heart all day? I think I, uh, the last message I spoke here was de- dealing with anxiety. And the truth is anxiety is real. It's a real thing. Not going to discount it at all. Being anxious is totally real. We've all done it. We've all experienced it because we don't know what's going to happen. But you can't let it control your everyday life. You can feel it, but you have to, as soon as you feel it, you have to go and entreat God and, and be honest and say, hey, I'm feeling anxious right now. I need your help. And come to him and trust that he's going to be there for you. This battle of emotions continues from anxiety all the way to grief in what David's experiencing here. And we've all experienced grief, I'm sure, in deaths, most importantly. I love the, the Jewish process of, of sitting Shiva. I don't know if any of you have heard of this, but I experienced it a lot when uh, I was living in New York. And the, one of the coolest experiences I ever got to you know, serve in, in capacity-wise is actually preside over an Orthodox Jewish funeral. Because the person who passed away was a Messianic Jewish believer. And for some reason, God connected me with her son. And next thing you know, I'm standing in front of 200 Orthodox Jewish people presiding over a, a funeral. And watching them grieve. And it was so mind-blowing to see the process of sitting Shiva was basically after the funeral, it's a period of about seven days where the family just stops everything. They, they gather together and they remember that person. And they eat and they schmooze, obviously. And they actually sometimes, make, they actually sometimes joke about the person who's deceased, as any Jewish funny person would. But as soon as the, as soon as the Shiva ended, as soon as that period of seven days ended, They got up, there's there's no washing yourself during this time or changing clothes. So after the seven days, they got up, changed their clothes, took a shower, and continued with their everyday life. Not like it didn't happen, but they still continued on. There wasn't a battle after that period because they gave themselves time to grieve. They gave themselves a time to be anxious and grieve But after that time was over, they kept living their lives. That's so telling for us as believers. That's what we need to do. We can go through times of anxiety. We can go through times of grief. But as soon as they're done, as soon as that period of this happened, I'm contemplating it, I'm going to continue living and continue walking. My late grandfather, his birthday was recent, most recent, and it's been about a couple years since he passed. I was really close with him, intimately close with this guy. Like uh, He knew me, and I knew him, and it was such an intimate relationship with him that when he passed, it was heartbreaking for me. And I never really got that closure until his last birthday, this past anniversary and his birthday. 
And I'm, I'll never forget it. I was sitting by myself in my car after a long day thinking about this man and the, the great experiences that I had with him and the laughs and the memories and the great times and the trips and everything. And it occurred to me, it's over. He's not here anymore. Where is he? He's in heaven right now. He's in God's presence right now. I need to continue to walk. My time of Shiva is over. I don't need to have this battle going on with me anymore because he's in a, so much of a better place. I need to continue walking. And so that's what we need to do. Despite whatever's going on in this battle, we need to end the battle and continue to walk. It's essential that we choose to react to situations based off of God's words, his promises, and the refuge that he provides. Remember, the enemy wants us to feel alone. The enemy wants us to feel isolated. But that's not what God wants. The book of Nahum, chapter 1, verse 7, says this, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. He's always there for us. He will always be a refuge where we can seek out whenever needed. The world doesn't have that. We do. When the unbelievers go through problems, they have nowhere to go. But as believers, we do. We have a rock and a fortress that we can always rely on. And as soon as we walk through those gates and those gates close and we're in the presence of God, it's just us and him. And he's there to encourage us to keep walking. As we progress through this psalm, at the tail end of, of verse 2, David highlights an interesting aspect of his relationship with the enemy and the people that were probably causing problems in his life. There's a success of the enemy that David's highlighting. He says in verse 13 at the end of verse, or chapter 13 and verse 2, how long will my enemy be exalted over me? Through David's life, many enemies had victories over him. He had en victories over his enemies. But I think the one thing that God taught David throughout his entire life was humility. David wasn't king as soon as he was anointed, right? He had to go through a lot before he was finally anointed king. He had to see a lot of people dear to him die and pass away and be killed by the enemy before he was crowned king before he was put in charge of God's people. He had to learn humility throughout the process. And that's what we have to do too. We can't look at problems as they're just to beat us up and show us how bad we are. We have to flip it and look at it as an opportunity to be humble, to wait on God, to learn throughout the process of walking. And humility is not an easy lesson, right? It's a tough lesson. It's probably one of the hardest lessons we're gonna ha we all have to learn in life, but it's also the most valuable lesson that we have to live in life. It's really a training ground. It really is. And remember, the success of our lives are not based on anything we do here on earth. As soon as you put your faith in Messiah Yeshua, as soon as you put your faith and trust in God their creator, you are a success in God's eyes. 100%. Without a doubt you're a success in God's eyes. And there's nothing the enemy can do or nothing a problem or a struggle can do that can take that away from you. You're already, already counted a success in God's eyes. Remember, the success of an enemy in your life is only temporary because at the end of the day, they have nothing to go back to. They have no foundation in their lives. They're living their lives day in and day out. But remember, we have a hope, a greater hope that we can look forward to and we're already a success, and we have an inheritance that we know is going to come in the future. And we can hang our hats on that. Remember, it's not about your success or the enemy's success. At the end of the day, it's really just about glorifying God, glorifying the Creator, and waiting on Him to guide you through your struggle. One of, uh, one of the things I always tell myself, especially when I'm struggling, going through tough times, is, Testing every door, no matter what that door looks like, testing it. 
and giving it up to God. And if that door's open, God's going to open the door. But remember, it's going to be on us to walk through it. It goes back to walking through the valleys. We still have to walk through them. So you might ask, okay, if I'm walking through my problems every day and I'm already a success, well then what's the point? What's the point of walking through struggles and tough times and just what's the point? And I have one word for you, and it's enlightenment. An enriched life. That's the point, and that's the reason. Psalm 13, uh, 13 verse 3 says, Consider and answer me, O Lord my God. Enlighten my eyes, or I will sleep the sleep of death. In the 1800s, our Jewish people were going through a time of enlightenment, if you should say. The modern world was evolving and developing technologies and things that were far more advanced than anything that had ever preceded it. And the Jewish people had to make a choice. Are we going to continue to be modern? Are we going to be stuck in our old ways? That's the only way we're going to survive. And they actually call it the Enlightenment because that's what it was. They chose to use their identity as a Jewish person to move forward into the modern world and create an identity for themselves in the modern world and thrive. Change their way of thinking to where we're going to work with the modern world and we're going to try to develop our culture to where it works symbiotically. We're not going to be stuck in the past. And that's what we have to do. As believers, we cannot be stuck in the past. We have to seek enlightenment from God every single day. Because what's that going to bring? It's going to bring an enriched life, a blessed life. And that's what we want. We want to be blessed. We don't want to live a struggle, problem-filled life. At the end of the day, we want to be blessed. And so that's what we have to do. We have to seek enlightenment. We have to recognize that despite the world changing, our calling remains the same. What's that calling? Reflecting God's light into a very, very, very dark world. And every day we have to consider how do we do that to the best of our ability? By seeking enlightenment in that process and enriching ourselves and enriching our life. Remember, those, those people in the world they're going to eventually sleep the sleep of death, as David writes, if they don't put their faith in Messiah. That might be a tough thing to think about, but it's the truth. They're going to sleep the sleep of death. As believers, we're never going to sleep that sleep. <laughs> Once we close our eyes, absent in the body, present with the Lord, for eternity, we will never, ever have to experience the sleep of death. But along the way, we have the opportunity to live an enriched life if we seek enlightenment, as David's asking the Lord here. Ephesians 1.18 says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. Our hope, remember, remember this, our hope is not in anything earthly, our hope is an inheritance that is everlasting and not on this earth. Yet. Because remember, God's kingdom is going to come down on this earth in the end times, after it's all said and done. But it's not yet. Our inheritance is everlasting, but we still have to live. And hope that when we walk every single day in God's plan and through God's will of our lives, our lives will be enriched through the process. And it's really important and wise of us to make sure that our hearts are reminded of this as we encounter and walk through our problems. Because like I said earlier, we can get caught up in things and we can want control. And that can actually damper our ability to be enlightened on a daily basis through God's word. Psalm 13 verse 4, we see a reminder for the representatives. David says, and my enemy will say, I have overcome him, and my adversaries will rejoice when I am shaken. We represent God, whether we like it or not, in every situation we encounter. The good, 
the bad, the ugly, the blessed, the happy, the sad. We represent God. And what David's saying here is, if my enemies keep succeeding, it's going to reflect on you. And he's putting that to God. All his anxiety and his problems that he has on earth, he's giving that up to God saying, if if my enemies keep having success over everything in my life, it's going to reflect badly on you. It's so important to think about that whatever we do, especially what we say, is scrutinized, whether we like it or not, because we represent the Creator here on earth. When I was in college, my first year in undergrad in college, I went from a completely believing household, I was strong in my faith, I was very, very motivated to live a life in service of God as far as whatever He wanted me to do, And I was taken out from that little bubble in that world and placed in an extremely secular environment where everything I did and said was scrutinized. And because I stood for what was right, I was made fun of. And I was told that I was different in the wrong way, in the bad way. But the foundation that I built throughout my life up to that point helped me get through that time of being scrutinized. And reminded me that whatever I do going forward, especially my interactions with whoever I, where I was in my life, I'm representing God. And you have to take that with you every single day in whatever you do. You're a representative. Through the good, through the bad. And this world is always going to try to break you down and, conform, and force you to conform. But remember, you have a strong foundation that you stand on. You have that rock that's God's word and his presence in your life that you can stand on. 1 Peter 2.9 says, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You are set apart. You're different in a good way, not a bad way. God has an inheritance and something for you so greater than you can ever imagine. And that's what we have to remind ourselves when we're walking through our problems. Psalm 13, verses 5, we see the location of the heart. After David prays all of this and all of his emotional struggles and all of his problems with what's going on in his life and where is God and asking him, where are you? He ends this psalm with, I think, a real telling statement of where he was at in his life. Psalm 13, verse 5 says, But I have trusted in your faithfulness. My heart shall rejoice in your salvation. I will sing to the Lord, because he has looked after me. Now, that doesn't really sound like where David was in the very first couple verses of this psalm, right? It seemed like David was in despair in the first beginning of this psalm. Now we're at the very end of this psalm, And David says, I have trusted in your faithfulness. Other translations says, I have trusted in your loving kindness. And David uses loving kindness as a way to illustrate God's love for him throughout the process of where he had been, throughout the struggles of where he had been. He had already, God was there the whole time and he was faithful to him to bring him through to the other side of the problem to the mountaintop where he could experience fresh air outside of the struggle. Verse 6, And I will sing to the Lord because he has looked after me. That seems like a far cry from someone where David, in the beginning David was saying, you've forgotten about me. Where are you, God? I can't sense you. It's quite the turn. But see, this is David coming to the progression of probably throughout his entire life that God had been there every step of the way. And that he was teaching him to be a man after God's own heart. It wasn't like as soon as David was crowned, he was a man after God's own heart. It was after David had lived his entire life and been through very many struggles. I love the book of Ruth and the character of Ruth and her progression throughout her life of trusting in God. And loving kindness is actually a theme of the entire book of Ruth. 
But when you think about Ruth's actions and the choices she had, she could either go back to her nation and what was old and what she was comfortable with, or she could choose to trust in God and his faithfulness to her and what she had experienced already with Naomi and the rest of the family. What does she say? My God will be your God to Naomi. My people, your people will be my people. She chose to identify with the God of Israel, the same God who we have a personal relationship with, who can demonstrate any amount of love and peace and wisdom. He can give that all to us. We have direct access to that. And our hearts should be continually seeking that every day. We have a hope because of all that. Romans 5.5 5 says, And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. God's presence is so valuable, folks. I cannot emphasize that, how valuable it is. And having that presence a part of your everyday life will fast track your way through problems. Not saying it will be on the fast track that you think, but it will be on God's track and his fast track. That's where your heart needs to be. Trusting in his faithfulness. Rejoicing in his salvation. Singing to the Lord because you already know that God has looked after you through the problems and the struggles. So let's tie it all together here. When will we get there? Are we there yet? Am I at the end of the problem if you're going through something right now? How do we properly walk through those things? And I have two things for you. Two things to take home and mull over in your, in your head as you're going through your struggles or something pops up and you need something to lean upon. There's two things. One, you can walk through your problems in his timing and love. And that all goes back to the control aspect. Remember, as humans, we want to control every situation we're in. But we have to give that up. We have to trust in his timing. Acts 1 7 says, But he said to them, Yeshua, to the disciples, It is not for you to know the periods of time or appointed times which the Father has set by his own authority. The disciples were freaking out because they knew Yeshua had raised from the dead and he was telling them, I'm leaving you. I got to go back to my Father to prepare a place for you. But the disciples were asking, Aren't you going to establish your kingdom now? You're, why do you need to leave us? Why are you leaving? They were going through a bunch of emotions. And asking him, when, 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 when? And Yeshua says, it's not for you to know. It's his timing outside of our control. You can put your trust in your unknown future into the hands of an unknown God. Or, uh, you can put your trust in your future, in your unknown future, into the hands of a known God. God is known. He's real. He's there. And we can, put our, we can hang our hats on that and trust that 100% throughout your entire life. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, He has made everything appropriate in its time, and He has also set eternity in their heart without the possibility that mankind will find out the work which God has done from the beginning to the end. Solomon, as King Solomon, as he was writing this, he had lived an entire life filled with God's wisdom. And he had seen that everything that he had done in the beginning was fruitful because he included God in the decision process and what he was doing. But after a while, he tended to forget because he sought more and more and more and more. And using the wisdom he had, he sought it for his own gain more and more and more and more. And he wanted to know anything and everything. As time has passed, Technology has advanced. Things have become more easily assess accessible to us. We want to know anything and everything. God has put it in us. Intuition. Curiosity. But it's not on us to know what's going to happen in the end. It's not on us to know what's going to happen every step of our lives. It's about us trusting and being humble and waiting on God to walk us through because we're trusting that the very end process and the very end destination, when we get out of that car 
through the bumpy road trip that we were in, it was all worth it. It was all worth it. Think about this quote. Faith is acting like something is so, even when it's not so, in order that it might be so, because God said so. God's made a promise to you to be there for you. In his word, you can read it every single day. He will be there for you in the good times, in the bad. Regardless of what you're going through, he's going to be there. And we have to have faith every single day. As soon as you open your eyes and you get out of bed, you have to have faith that everything you encounter in your da- on the daily basis, you are meant to encounter. 100%. God loves you so much. And sometimes it's not said enough to each other. Look to the person to your right or your left and say, God loves you. He does. And we have to remind ourselves of that. Because remember, we're, we feel alone when we go through struggles and problems. God loves you. And there's nothing that can limit that. Jeremiah 31.3 says, The Lord appeared to him long ago saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, I have drawn you out with kindness. You know what was going on when Jeremiah wrote this? The, sen- the temple was destroyed and the people of Israel were taken in captivity to Babylon. God still loved his people. He brought them back out of captivity after he had to teach them the lessons they needed to learn before they came back to the land and drew them back with kindness and everlasting love. That same love is geared towards you. That same love. It's everlasting. So the first point of walking through your problems is through His timing and His love. Second, it's through our growth and our maturity. There are two pains in life, the pain of discipline and the pain of regret. Seems opposite, but the truth is is that discipline weighs ounces, but regret weighs tons. If we choose to make decisions in life and not consider God, and bad things happen, the regret of not considering and consulting God can weigh a ton, can it? Because we think, well, what if we would have just considered God in the decision process? What could have happened? That regret can weigh tons. But if you discipline yourself every single day to grow in your relationship with God, to walk through your problems and wait on the Lord and experience the maturity that comes through that, it's quite the experience especially when you come outside of, on the other end of the problem. Second Chronicles 20.12, King Jehoshaphat, after a huge multitude of, uh, of the nations coming to destroy him and his kingdom, the first thing he does is he goes directly to God and he says this, Our God, will you not judge them? For we are powerless before this great multitude that is coming against us, nor do we know what to do but our eyes are on you. Our eyes continually have to be on God. Cannot be distracted. Because if we are distracted and get caught up in our own daily problems, we'll lose sight of what's truly important, of being a representative for God. So that when other people see us going through problems, they want to be like us. Because we come out the other side growing and maturing. Ephesians 4 verse 14 says, As a result, we are no longer to be children tossed here and there by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of people, by craftiness and deceitful scheming. Verse 15, But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into Him who is the head, that is Messiah. We have a foundation and a rock we can stand on every single day. Unbelievers don't have that. That's the sad part. That's why we're called to reach out to them and say, hey, you can have this foundation too. 
You can stand on this rock and be supported too. You don't have to be tossed by the waves. Sometimes it feels like the world is trying to erode us away, doesn't it? Does it not? With the media and everything that's been said and the world and the, the agenda it's trying to push against believers. But we have to remind ourselves, like it said in Ephesians, where you cannot be, we're not carried away by the waves and the wind. We're called to grow. We're, call, we're called to mature. It's all about seeking Him and waiting on Him. Lamentations 3.25 says, The Lord is good to those who await Him, to the person who seeks Him. It's so important, and I cannot emphasize it enough, to find points in your day to seek Him whether it's in your car driving to work, whether it's at the end of your day when you're the most exhausted and the enemy can creep in and has the most advantage. Seeking Him and seeking His presence is so important because He can give you the life and the encouragement and the joy and the peace you need to keep going by seeking Him. God's peace is so valuable and so powerful that it can get you through literally anything. But you have to be humble and let it. Yeshua's own words, John 16, says, These things I have spoken to you so that in me you may have peace. In the world you have tribulation, but take courage, I have overcome the world. We've put our faith in a Messiah that has overcome anything and everything the world has to throw at us. That's who we're putting our faith in. That should give you joy. Most importantly, it should give you peace throughout whatever you're doing. So remember, whether you're on the mountaintops, whether you're in the valley, you're the same person. The same person that God created, the same person that God loves, and that same person that God died for. You're that same person that God wants a personal relationship on a daily basis. It hasn't changed no matter how isolated you may feel. That's why we should trust in God's faithfulness. Because He will always, always be there to guide you through your problems, no matter what you're going through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your presence in our lives. We may feel separated. We may feel isolated but we know at the end of the day that's just an attack by the enemy. We know that the enemy can never win. We know and we understand that you are powerful and capable of bringing us through any trouble, any struggle, any problem. We humble ourselves and we ask that you would teach us the lessons that we need to learn. So that when we come on the other side of the journey and you're, we're where you need us to be, we can look back and share our experiences with others and the joy that you bring and the peace that you give us with people who don't have that joy or peace. Thank you for your word that we can look into it and use it as a guide for our own lives. We pray you give us courage to keep walking through whatever comes our way. Because we might not know what to do, but God, our eyes, they're directly on you. So we pray this in your son Yeshua's name. Amen. Hi, I'm Hannah Katz from Shuva Yisrael in Irvine, California. Click here on the round Shuva logo to subscribe to our YouTube channel and never miss a Shuva video. Tada B'Shem Yeshua.